um, a local bloke called Andy Ackley approached me, I don't know what year, and I said, look, you know, um, there's this touring car series in Britain, yeah. you know, um, would you, you know, would you do it with me? There's new Honda Civics, and I bought a Honda Civic, and it, somebody else ran it. I didn't run it, but that was the first foray. The following year, Honda brought out the CRX series, yeah. so I got three, three cars. <laughs> I bought and did that with Andy. So you Rick were, were you running out of the Honda dealership or a separate? My out of the dealership. Out the back of it, yeah. yeah. I ran Rick Shortle. Andy Ackley and Tim Lee Davey. Right. And we weren't doing very well. We thought, this is weird, you know. I don't know what's going on. Cause we, I don't know how to assemble cars. It was all done by yeah, my sure. mechanics. We didn't yeah, employ yeah. anybody. It was just all in-house. So we got a chap called Paul Taft in one day to do a test at Silverstone. And he went around half a second quicker than the other lads. Right. And they looked at each other and said, hmm, it's down to us then. Okay. <laughs> Which yeah, is good. The car. And then we won the championship for the next two years. In fact, we were one two one two in the championship right. for the following two good. years. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. Um, and then what did we do? I then got involved in touring cars. Mm. Yeah. With your own teams. Yes. There we were getting. Well, I did that. Oh no! I tell a lie. <clears throat> My goodness, I changed from there. What then happened is that a chap called Mickey Van Hall came over. Right who is the Van Hall family, yeah. and they were sponsors of Surtees. And in fact, they, they, they gave us a trailer, a bare trailer, which we converted. Yeah. Just gave us the bare trailer. So, and Jan Van Hall, one of the brothers, used to come and stay with me in the summer and work on the team. Right. So anyway, his younger brother, Mickey, wanted to go, was doing Formula 3, and he started in Europe. And they said, would you look after him? Would you take him around some of the teams? Right. You know, when he comes over to see what it's all about. Yeah. So we went to about two or three teams and I heard all the spiel and everything. I thought, oh yeah, they know he's got money. Yeah. Um, and they said, oh, we could drive for XYZ team. I said, you can drive for Lotus Formula One if you want. Yeah. So what do you mean? I said, give us a checkbook. <laughs> yeah. And they said, oh, oh, really? So then eventually, <laughs> after all going around, I, I didn't sell it, they said, would you run him? I said, what do you mean? But would you set a team up and run him? I went, yeah, I suppose I could. Yeah. Uh, this would be 1991. But the dealership is still going on as well. Oh, 100%. Yeah, right. Um, <clears throat> so I said, yeah, okay. So I said, I'll tell you what we'll do. Let's buy a year-old route and just get you out and do some miles That's and things. And, uh, there's a it. chap who came to work with me called Adrian Brown, who was David Bradman's mechanic when David won the British Championship. Right. So Adrian was so the link to us. Yeah. Because Lisa Brappen drove for me in the CRX, and oh, okay. that's why I met David. So, yeah. so we set up a Formula 3 team for him, um, and then went to the first race at Thruxton, my little one-car team. Mm-hmm. And This was still with a year-old route. Yeah. yeah. And Rick Gorn came up to me from Reynard and said, I've seen how you operate. Would you run our works team? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, we've got Gilles de Ferran. Yeah. He said, we're running it in-house. He said, would you run Gilles for us mm. in your team? I said, well, whatever. Anyway, we ended up doing an amazing deal where I had two Reynards and we were the works team as such. Now, this is coming from not doing anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and we had Roly Vencini come as the engineer. Do you know Roly? No. No, he was an ex brabham bloke. But uh, yeah, very um, strong in his opinions. And he worked for Reynard. We had the mechanic come for Gilles and all the development right, stuff, right. which was good. And it was okay, the car. It wasn't amazing. Um, and I remember going to Brands Hatch, because Routes were the car at the time. And I walked around the grid and I thought, something wrong here. You know, all these routes got these huge wings on. We've got this tiny little aerodynamic thing on the back. Right. And I said to Ray, I said, look, this is wrong here. Uh, I said, look, can I test a, a bigger wing on it? Mm-hmm. I said, yeah, okay. So they actually put Christian Fittipaldi in the car at Snet, and he went out. The first real run, he was like three-tenths quicker. He said, unbelievable. He said, a huge understeer. Right. So then we worked on it, mm-hmm. went to the next race, and won it. So just that common yeah. sense thing. Surely. Can you know, you look at things and you yeah. say, hang on, this is odd. And then the Reynard won a few races that year, which is pretty good, mm-hmm. um, with Gilles. <laughs> he then went off to Paul Stewart's yeah. and left me in the lurch as such. Um, and then I ran 
various team, various people in Formula Three. I yeah. ran uh, Ollie Gavin, yeah, um, and finished second because I was we bought to Lara's halfway through the year. Um, then he went off to do Formula One with Pacific, which of course never happened. Yeah. He then came back in '95, and we won the British Formula Three Championship with him, um, which I was very pleased about. And you're still in Edenbridge at this point. Still running the team from the back of the garage. <laughs> excellent, yeah, always. Yeah. Excellent, yeah, it was excellent. Yeah. yeah, and some of the boys on the in the garage came and worked at weekends with us. It was oh, all sure. from there. Yeah, I bet they enjoyed it too. Yeah, it was good. Absolutely. So you carried on with the so that was F three. F three. Still, yeah, won the British Formula Three Championship in ninety five with right. Ollie. Then I made a big mistake. You went into F3000? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know. Cool. Well, I'm a racer. I'm not a businessman when it comes to racing. I should have stayed in Formula 3 and made a lot of money by yeah. running, you know, people with big checks, and I yeah. didn't. Because there was the new 3000 started. Charlie Charlie Whiting lived opposite, because I knew Charlie very well. Mm. And, of course, he was involved in the F1 Formula 1. Business. And I said, Charlie, I want to do this. That's a good idea, mate. First season, good idea. Get in there. So <laughs> I bought a couple of cars, and nobody wanted to drive for us. Because right. although we'd won the British Formula 3 Championship, yeah. we'd done nothing. And, you know, in 3000, people didn't no, know who we were. And I was really, 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 I couldn't believe it because we had a fantastic team. Yeah. Really, honestly, brilliant engineers. Everything was correct. Couldn't get a driver. I ended up with two, a French lad who obviously had never had much money but wanted to do Poe, and a right. Swedish English man whose dad was a con man, of no doubt, I'm sure. I'm not particularly quick. And we went off and did the first couple of races, three races, and then the Frenchman ran out of money, so I had one car. And then that guy didn't want to pay. He was dodgy. And so there I was, having been very successful the year before, mm. uh, with two lovely cars and a nice little truck and all the equipment. And uh, and we had even had a, a Van Hall coach hospitality yeah. unit. I mean, it was really nice. smart. Yeah, Everything what, was done. What cars were they being picked? Uh, they're all Lolas in okay. those days. It was right. fixed car, fixed right. Lolas. Yeah. So we um, got to a stage where I didn't have a driver. And then somebody phoned me up and said, look, there's a bloke you ought to try. He, has, he hasn't got much money and he's, he hasn't got a drive. A bloke called Tom Christensen. Right. And I said, OK, you know, what's he what got? They said, yeah. well, he's got five grand from, um, he's got a German sponsor. He wants to do Hockenheim. I said, yeah, OK. So we went and... Finished fourth in his first race, and I thought, yeah, yeah that's right. interesting, isn't it? Mm. It's obviously the light bulb in there that matters, and not yeah. everything else. Yeah. And so we then went to the next race, which was Spa. Um, again, we only had Tom, and he had no money at all. Right. And my old long-term friends, Mezzanine Floor Company, who'd sponsored me for years, said, look, we'll give you five grand, Pete. And we went to Spa, didn't take the hospitality, just had the truck, other mm -hmm. teams fed us, and in fact... Friends, Diane Stu Spires, who worked for us at Surtees, fed me from Benetton and things mm -hmm. to the team. It was all very friendly. Um, we had one practice session, because the other one was rained off, and Tom put it on pole. I went, whoa, what <laughs> is this about? Blimey, that's better. <laughs> yes, and in fact, he screwed up at the race, because he made a bad start. I think we finished third or second, but it was very close. But still. And then he had a huge race <clears throat> in Silverstone, where he was neck and neck for the lead, and game finished second. And I always remember Max actually wrote an article about budgets in, form, in motor racing. He said, my good friend Peter Briggs, I thought, oh, that's fair enough, I'm your friend now, um, went to Spa with absolutely no money, put it on pole. You don't need huge budgets to do all this, which is true to a certain extent. So then after that, because of Tom, um, we then got people in the car, like uh, Cachero and people like that, yeah. to finish the season. And Tom was finished by then. Well, you didn't have any money. Exactly. I couldn't, you know, I, I couldn't afford it, you no, know. It was no. costing me money as it was to get him where he was. Sure. And then he got picked up by other people, yeah. which I'm really pleased for. Um, you know, because it did us both good. Of course. You know, it gave him... The, the up. People saw where he was of going, course. what he was capable of. And yeah. so, so, and my team. So the following year, I ended up with... Uh, a Brazilian driver and a South African, Werner Lutberger, brilliant young lad, brilliant, nice, very lovely family. And um, my goodness me, how can I forget someone's name who drove me for two seasons? Brazilian. Brazilian. Louis, uh, no, um, Max Wilson. Oh, sure. Stupid, that's In, right. Total brain. Did he go to IndyCars? Yeah, he, he did, did all sorts. But Max 
I had Max and Werner. Werner would do whatever we asked him to do. He was brilliant. Um, sadly, Max would not believe you or listen to you and would get very angry and things. And he was a very stupid little bloke, really. Um, I remember we were at Oscherschleben and we were on the pit wall and it was a drying circuit. Mm -hmm. And I watched someone come in and saw how quick they were straight away. I said, in Max, now, this yeah. lap. Signal board. What, now? In Max, now. What, 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 one more lap. In Max, now. He did two more laps. Right. The guy he was in front of pitted and won the race. Right. If he'd have listened, he would have won it. Yeah. But he would never, ever, ever listen. And that was his big failure. Yeah. But they stayed on the second year, both drivers, which I was very proud of to actually, because they both paid proper budgets. Yeah. And to have two drivers continue is nice. a very, very Absolutely. good thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, then the cars changed and there was a new car for 98. Yeah. 96. 96, 96 99. Basically right. 99. And it was going to be a tough year because everyone wanted to get in and Bernie was trying to restrict it. So first of all, you said, right, anybody who wants a car, I've got to pay up front for them. Right. So in like August, we had to pay up front for them. Then Bernie came, right, you've got to pay for your engines up front in September, which is a serious little big investment yeah. going out here. But we ended up still with too many cars in the championship. Right. Can I stop a minute? Hmm? Yeah, sure. I need to wait. <laughs> So it was a pretty bad time for motor racing because we had possibly 32 cars, these new series, yeah. all identical. Um, but you go to some races, there'd be 24 starters, Monaco 20, and they did pre-qualifying for 20 minutes or something. And I still had Werner Luckberger from the year, two years before driving for me. But I realised at certain events he would struggle to qualify as a lot of people would yeah. we're talking you know nearly half the grid not qualifying mm. and when people were paying half a million pounds to drive for the season I thought it was wrong for Werner because um, I knew the family and everything um, and I was worried about the situation and I was approached by a chap called Paul Stoddart who was helping to was sponsoring Terrells at the moment he had a little aviation business um, and he wanted to buy into a team. And I thought, well, look, I can't see how this is going to work this year because we're going to struggle to get drivers who guarantee it. Right. So he came in and basically funded it, but he wanted his own drivers and his own selection, this and this and this and this. And so I, I, I said to Van, look, mate, I think this is the best thing. And what I actually did, I moved him to another team in England with my cards and gave them all the setups and helped them and do that for their reserve. Uh, European series going on yeah. of the old cars yeah. so then we were going to run Jamie Davies and Ollie Gavin mm -hmm. uh, under European aviation he brought some of his people in and the plan was it would stay in Edenbridge until the end of the year and then he would take it to his place at Ledbury okay. all right um, and so he guaranteed he'd pay all the staff to the end of the year the rent for the premises where I was all that sort of stuff right, it was all right. laid down back and white. so it was a very um, I shall say basic sort of Australian um, <clears throat> and we went to a few races and went to Monaco and finished got points at Monaco which is good should have had more but Jamie sadly got balked on the last corner in qualifying but you know it was very up and down Went to Manicor, Cor, Cor, Manicor, and neither driver qualified. Missed by thousands, but we didn't, you know, it, it was possible. Yeah. yeah. And he immediately said, I'm taking the team. I'm, I'm having it. It's coming back to mine. You've sabotaged the team. You sent them out with the wrong tyre pressures. Absolute lies, of course, of everything. Mm. Uh, Tony Jardine was working for him doing press. Had a press release already done, so it was all pre-planned. Oh. Um, and I want it back, I want it straight back, to go straight back to Ledbury and this place. And I said, well, look, okay. I said, but we've got to stop in Edenbridge because I've got stuff in there that belongs to me that isn't yours. Sure. You know, obviously I'm not happy about any of this and all this. Um, he spoke to the truck. He said, if you don't go straight back, I'm suing you personally for all, everything you've got. I mean, man, is nasty. Mm. So then I got a call from my, so we agreed that we're going back. I then get a call from my secretary 
saying, Peter, he said, we've got four big blokes outside. He'd sent four heavies into right. my garage premises where the race team was based, yeah. right? Yeah. To stand there waiting for the trucks to come back. A big heavies. Mm. Um, he demanded that we went straight to his place. I said, no, we're going to stop in Eden Bridge. We'll swap stuff over and all that sort mm. of stuff. He then had people waiting at Dover to meet the trucks. <laughs> right. Um, and when it came, he took and off he went with his stuff. None of my staff went. All right, the engineers, none of them, because they yeah. all realised what a nasty bit of work this man was. Mm. Okay, fine. All right. I said, lads, it's okay, lads. And, you know, I'm paying you. It's all sorted. Sure, sure. You know. You know, and I was heartbroken because, you know, I just yeah, couldn't believe what this bloke had done. He was threatening to sue my wife at the time and myself, the shareholders, for this, for everything we've got. And, you know, he had a lawyer employed full time by himself, right. you know. He was a nasty, nasty man. So, um, I thought, well, okay, you know. At least. Then, of course, he never paid. Right. Never paid, never paid. So I had the upper hand because what he had, what you had to do then is there was a company called Side Puma Limited, which actually held the entrance license, right. which is a company I had. Now you needed that with the points sure. to go ahead for the following years. So I spoke to Max because I, you know, I got quite well with Max, but we not. And yeah, he was actually helping my solicitor and all right. this sort of stuff. And we had him because we had at the end of the year because I had the points, he mm. would have had to pay me to get the company yeah. to do the entry, yeah. which is fine. And it was about 150000 So then well, I had the court case ongoing, and then um, we received a letter that the FIA had granted him permission to change the name without the company, which is totally against FIA regulations yeah. and all that sort of stuff. But obviously, I think that Bernie and Max realised there was this Australian man who was going to put money into Formula One. It must be more important than Pete Briggs. Yeah. And so, basically, turned me over. Mm. So, we still went ahead with the court case, but he had folded that company yeah. who was handling it. So, so he ended up with nothing. Mm. So, yeah, not a very nice taste, yeah, actually. To finish with. Yeah, yeah. and it was. And, and I, to this day, I'm sure it's because they realised this idiot Australian was going to yeah. put money into yeah. everything. Yeah. He actually didn't have a lot of money. Everything he had was borrowed and everything was second hand. He bought all the Tyrrell stuff and I That's went right, up to remember, his place. And it was all decked out with computers and everything, but none of them were connected. You know, it had loads of second hand rusty old trucks. Everything he had was second hand and nasty. Mm. And that sadly was what the bloke was like. And he dealt in second hand aircraft parts. Yeah. yeah. So, mm. anyway. That's right. Um, <clears throat> I never had to steal them again. So, anyway, forget him. And then um, I stopped for a while and concentrated on my garages and stuff. Still, yeah. Yeah. So you still had the dealership? Yeah, yeah. Dealerships? Yeah, yeah. Mm. That was still going and that was all happening. Yeah. And then, uh, what did I do? I got involved something, something, in touring cars. Yes. Talking about Macau. You, yeah, well, I worked, with, I worked with Barry Bland, actually. Right. Um, because um, part of the problem with, with, with Stoddart and everything, it... Um, I also received about the same time a letter from Honda saying that they wanted to change their policy and they didn't want to deal with dealer operators. They wanted big groups. Right. So they terminated like a third of the dealer network, me being one of them. Mm. So from earning a lot of money, I was all of a sudden yeah. zero. And then I had Stoddart and then I got divorced. Yeah. So it all hit me. <laughs> so it was all a bit of a, yeah. a mess at the time be honest with you it was all a bit nasty and I think it out had a lot to do with the divorce actually because uh, it affected her as well yeah. as me yeah. I think. so it wasn't a particularly nice situation um, you mentioned Macau yeah so what happened working. that's right so anyway uh, back in when I was doing Formula 3 my wife didn't want me to go to Macau um, or travel without her I don't know she had one of these things that she's not travelling together and Barry Bland was running in Macau. <clears throat> and when I split up with my wife, he phoned me up. He said, you're coming to Macau. I said, what do you mean? He said, you're coming to work with me. You should have been here with your team. You're coming. And so I went to Macau for a number of years, assisting Barry Bland in running right. the Macau event. Right. Which was most enjoyable. Mm. Most enjoyable. Mm. I only did it there. I didn't do anything <clears throat> back in England with him. But we also did Bahrain once, and we also did Korea a couple of times. Right. There's a nice little story about Bahrain. It's Formula 3. And... Lewis and Nico were doing Formula 3 and they both crashed at Macau, uh, the long thing, yeah, Tr yeah. both 
tried to outbreak each other and they neither would back off. So we went to Bahrain and amazing circuit for Formula 3. And on the podium, Lewis won from nearly the back of the, uh, the, of the field with about two laps to go. Amazing slip steaming drive. And on the podium, he was in tears. And I said, well, what's up? Yeah. He said, well, McLaren have dropped me. He said, well, I'm just praying this will turn it around. Yeah. And it did. Oh, we may not have a six-time yeah, world well, champion. Yeah, we'll check it. Amazing. He hadn't turned yes. So I did Macau with him. And then I was at Macau. <coughs> I um, got involved, watched the touring cars, and my sponsor friends were with me. We got involved and bought a couple of BMWs and ran yeah. in the BMWs in Europe mm -hmm. initially, and then Britain, and then I did more things like that with BMWs, mm -hmm. um, which I didn't enjoy. Uh, they're not my thing. Sort of thing. No, they bash into each other. Yes, that's right. It's not necessary. Yeah. I didn't really yeah. enjoy that very much. Yeah. And then I ran a couple of young drivers from Macau, China, mm -hmm. um, over here, set teams up, well, set a team up for the first one, but the second one I placed him somewhere and just taught him. Yeah. And I always remember we went off to, it was a Macau driver, and the plan was they always wanted a driver in their race at the end of the year, and this right, lad had been sure. doing karting. And I met him, and yeah, we did arrange what I was going to do. I said, right, I want you to do two or three Formula 4 races first. Yeah. So we went off to Anglesey and I booked it exclusively with the team, Falcon Motorsport, and got their driver there. And I said, look, if we do it this way, it's cheap, but, you know... You, you get used to it. Yeah, it's without any problems, it's private, there's nobody yeah. else on yeah. the track. So we're driving up, I said, you've driven a car, haven't you? No. I said, I know you haven't driven a race car, a road car. No. Oh. Uh, what do you mean you've never driven a road car? No. I said, well, you're like in a drive, you know, perhaps... No. I said, so you've never used a clutch? No. Oh, blimey. I went, okay. So uh, I got in the car park at the hotel and taught him what a clutch was and things like that. <clears throat> and then so next How day, old would he have been, Pete? How old what? How old would he have been? 19. Right. Okay. 18, 19, yeah. 18, 18, yeah. probably. Um, <laughs> he'd, been doing, he'd been doing European karting. Yeah. You know, but that's no it. Clutch. People took him around no and that's it. So then we got him in the high car for about an hour, going around the circuit. Then yeah. we put him in the Formula Ford car. And then we went off and did races that year, at the end of the year it was. And he actually did all right. He was actually quite good. Yeah. And then we were running him in Formula 3 the next year. Um, and I put him with uh, Double R Racing. And they looked after him and he did those races. And then at the end of the year he said, nothing. Didn't even say goodbye. He just goes off. Not thanks a lot for everything you've done for me. And next year he came back and drove for somebody else. But... Funny, isn't it? Chinese, very strange. Strange, isn't it? And what's he doing now? Saying that? Nothing. No, he gave up. He did three years and, and then enough. stopped. And just stopped. He wasn't really into it. He was more interested in his helmet with little diamantes in and special boots and things oh. like that. Oh. Really? Yeah. Honestly? Yeah. Not there. Uh, so what, what year had that been, Pete? That was, I, my goodness me, I can't remember now. Probably about four or five years ago. So you were, um, straight after that, you went to West Surrey Racing? Oh, I did bits then. Bits. Just freelance bits, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just did freelance bits did, with the touring car team, did yeah. some A1 stuff and all that sort right. of stuff. Right. That was before then, actually. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, just doing...